Welcome to Tip Top, growing up your business with Metronomics. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, and stories on how you can grow up your company at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. I am your host, Jed Roberts. Today, I'm with Carl Saunders. Carl Saunders is also a metronomics coach. Uh, And today, we want to talk about his journey through to being a CEO and then transitioning into becoming a metronomics coach. Good to have you on the show, Carl. How are you? I am very well, thank you. It's a beautiful, sunny, warm day in Vancouver. We haven't had many, so enjoy it. Oh, well, it's a it's a chilly day here in winter in Sydney, but uh, the temperature's probably not too far off. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, Carl, you're 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 based in Vancouver, obviously, uh, and you know you've you've been part of the metronomics journey around the same sort of length of time as as I have been. Tell us a little bit about your background. You know where you know what got you to where you are now, and you know, maybe before Vorum and before your company and before you became a metronomics coach. How did you get to where you are now? Great question. Um, I'm trying to see how far back I go. I'll, I'll go to <laughs> launching my career, I guess. Uh, I did an engineering physics degree initially, um, came out to Vancouver, was interested in doing something in medicine, worked for seven years in research, and then spun out a company which was all about doing custom orthopedic devices outside the body uh, using automation. Um, ran it for two years, uh, failed miserably. Uh, only to have uh, one of the companies that we made a pitch to come back to me later and said, we'd like you to launch a new company and do something for us in medical footwear. Um, Interestingly enough, they only wanted the system for Sweden and they let me have the tech uh, globally to sell and to improve as we went. Um, Hired three people, that was 89. And fast forward... Uh, right through till, I guess, 2015. So some 20 years in, 25 years in, I guess, we had grown to 25 people, roughly 5 million in revenue, and had been there for kind of like five years running. Like just no matter what we did, no matter how many extra hours we put in, um, we just could not seem to... To crack the nut to to get any bigger. Um, so you got stuck. And oh my God, we were stuck. Yeah, for sure. And you know, it's that it's interesting, right? Because it's that old adage about we were we were profitable every single year of the twenty five, except one, um, which there was a good reason for. So we're we're pretty high on ourselves. Like we thought we we're pretty good, right? Um, what wasn't obvious, and now with the benefit of retrospect, of course, is that. Uh, that classic adage, you know, what what got us to five million actually wasn't going to get us any further. Um, I was a very slow learner. <laughs> you said you were profitable nearly every year, apart well, just apart from one. Um, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that's enough. You no, know, sometimes this you know, people say this feels good. I'm okay with this, but that probably wasn't the case for you. So what what drove you to want to to get past that blocker? What what drove you to, to 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 decide to take action to get past that plateau? One of the seminal moments for me was one of my brightest people came into my office one day and said, uh, "You know, Carl, I really appreciate the profit sharing checks that we get every year, um, but it's now been a couple of years now, and and frankly, I don't see us growing. And if we're not growing, um, then I don't see an opportunity for me to grow." And, um, you know, I don't mean to me this to be a threat or anything, but if I'm not growing, I'm going to need to start looking for other opportunities. And so that was, and so that was key for me in the grand scheme of things. Cause one of the things that one of my earliest mentors did for me was he said, every time you hire somebody, make sure you hire somebody smarter than you. And that was a wonderful piece of advice because it always was about, you know, finding someone smarter than me in a niche or a particular 
capability that I didn't have. Um, and so I had done that. And then as I look around, I'm thinking, geez, like if everybody, all these super smart people are thinking the same way, then actually staying in place is actually not a good thing at all. It only means that our competition is at minimum going to pass us and at worst, we're, we're going to start going downhill. So those were, those were some of the thoughts that came in as a result of that, that discussion. And I still think back to that as being a really, a real turning point for me mentally, you know. And you, you were fortunate that they actually told you that rather than just acting on it. Yeah, I think part of the thing that was interesting and maybe it's the same for other companies that start up small and, and go up to the 20s. We really had a, had a family culture. Um, you know, everybody was really tight. We had, we did our sports day activities twice a year, one winter sport, one summer sport, the kids came, all that stuff. So there was a kind of a tight uh, culture element in that. That So it would be really unusual for somebody just to come in one day and give in their you know, the resignation letter, they would, they would bring the stuff forward. So I think that was, that was a big part of it. Um, interestingly, that family culture also made getting to the next step more difficult. So this was Vorum, is that right? This, this is, Correct. this was your last, yeah, the last company. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, so you've got a, a bit of a shock. Someone's told you that they want to grow and they don't see the potential within the company at the moment. Uh, so you, you might not have been thinking about growth at that point before the conversation. So, so what did you do from there? What, what was your next step? Well, I guess part of it was that, uh, you know, I had to look in the mirror because actually I had been trying to grow it. <laughs> so, and I just, I wasn't successful. I was growing, I was working harder, um, but clearly not smarter. And I think what happened then is I happened to see up here in Vancouver, there was an organization that was promoting uh, a seminar, an in-person seminar, all around growth strategies in the tech sector. And uh, that was like 2014, no, 2015, yeah, like I was saying before. And uh, lo and behold, it was actually Shannon Sesco that was doing the presentation. And so at that time, that was actually before any of the books, right? That was before uh any of the series uh the system uh was there though because she had used it in her other companies and i remember going to the first lecture and going like wow this is a lot of stuff in there but like i said i'm a bit of a slow learner so i went to in the span of i think nine months months i went to three sessions and by the time i got to the, the th like break on the third session i'm going like this this is so powerful I mean, this is the first thing I've seen, which is, I, I guess what I want to say is it kind of pulls a whole bunch of things together as, so, as opposed to just sort of share one topic that would have me leaving going, great idea, but how do I use this? There was so much about how, how in Shannon's presentation that um, there's a rumor that I actually at the break got on my knees and begged her to take me on as a client. Um, you might have to go elsewhere to substantiate that rumor. Okay, so you you went to Shannon's uh, seminars or workshops, uh, and because I mean you probably went to those to to learn about how to grow a business, and that's very different to actually deciding to take on a coach, you know. And what I find is that, you know people I talk to they often want to they want to know how to do it, and they're not necessarily thinking that they need or want a coach. Now, the realization that they want or need a coach actually comes further down the track. Is that is that what happened for you? I don't think so. And, and I go back to what I was mentioning earlier about one of my mentors saying, like, how are people smarter than you? You know, I'd already been bouncing my head uh, against a brick wall for a couple of years trying to grow. And I'm going, I'm going in there going like, I don't know how to get here. I don't know how to get there from here. I need help. Like that was part of it, like right away. And then in that third seminar, I'm going like, like I'm still, I'm still in the whirlwind myself. I can't pull this off. I got to have help. And that, and that's why I, for me, the connection was right away. If I'm going to be able to do this, I need a coach right now. Yeah. So you'd already reached that realization that you needed help. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you've gone, you've gone from the desperation to, uh, I need to, I need to find a way to get out of this. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. Good summary. I'm, I'm curious about what, what were you telling the team as you were going through this process? Because, you know, you, you already knew that some people were feeling frustrated with their individual personal development. 
Um, so were, were you going back to them and saying, hold on, hold on, I'm working on it, I'm working on it, you know, we're gonna, we'll fix this, we'll fix this? Or, or you know, did you lose anyone in the end or did, did, did everyone stay and just go with the journey? In my case, I was very comfortable sharing with them. And they, frankly, they saw it, right? I was very comfortable sharing with them, look, I, I am not doing a good job growing this business. And I am going to go out and I'm going to find something and hopefully someone that will take us to the next step. And so by, I think by sharing that information across the the company, which as I say was family oriented, right? They kind of gave me some rope. So they gave me some rope to go out and do that. And once, once we actually got started with it and they could see that things were, you know, I was active now. It wasn't just the talk. We were actually, I was actually trying to walk that talk. Then, yeah, we didn't, we didn't lose anybody, but ooh, there was so much pushback from some sectors initially. Uh, it took much longer to get everybody on board than I had anticipated. And had you already started with Shannon at this point, or, or was this part of the journey to to start working with Shannon? No, this was this was immediately after I started working with Shannon, because immediately after we started working that, then it was all about you know working on developing out your three hags, you know your one hag, getting alignment across the company, uh, and I'm actually even getting further ahead than where I should be. Just at the beginning, just trying to get a daily huddle going. Oh God. You'd think I had asked for the world, right? I'm not sure we really have time for that, you know? So, so that was the kind of, and yet, as I was saying, it was like everybody knew we weren't growing. So, but to do this daily huddle, 15 minutes, when will I ever get that 15 minutes back? So that was how, that was how we started. So you had some people in your business who were hungry for development opportunities, uh, but and were, was it the same people who were pushing back, or was that a different group of people? Ironically, there was there was there certainly were a couple of people that were in you know that keen to do to, to see development opportunities that were actually pushing back on on the whole getting this new process going. It's like wild, like what? Now, I have to say, I made it, but it's on me also. I made a huge mistake. I was so enthusiastic to get the huddle going that I did. I came out uh, and I basically said, "Okay, starting next week, we're doing daily huddles across the entire organization." And that, and when we tried that, I think we did it for about three months. What a total disaster! Because I had all this pushback from various places, like. If I had only thought this through and just started the daily huddles in the leadership team, you know, run that so that the leadership team feels confident in it. So then it's like five leaders going out and talking to 25 people instead of one trying to talk to 24. Doesn't like it doesn't on the surface doesn't seem like crazy, but you have to <sighs> baby steps, build confidence and, and then and spread the word from multiple sources. That was the that was what I didn't appreciate from the beginning. Yeah, there's I mean that the there's the old saying, you know, you have to tell someone between five to eight times before it starts to register. Um, and I, I mentioned this in a previous podcast, and now I'm, I used to be a bit of a maths geek, and it's also occurred to me that you need to tell a CEO five to eight times that they need to tell people five to eight times before it starts to register. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy yeah <laughs> good one that yeah that grows pretty big that's for sure mm -hmm. yeah so so the interesting thing is you had people that were hungry for further development opportunities and yet they were pushing back on change and it reminds me of that old cartoon where you've got someone on the stage you know rousing an audience and he's you know saying to the he's asking the audience you know you know who wants change and everyone's putting their hands up and the next question is who wants to change and everyone puts their hands down. Yeah. They want change, but they don't want to change. Yeah. That's that's it in a nutshell. It's and and you know, and I don't know, man, I, I can't compare because I've only ever led tech companies and I coach tech companies now as well, just for context. Um I have to there's always something I wonder about that somehow having a whole bunch of technology people, engineers in particular, 
you know, there's this notion of their whole training is to question, question, question the whole time. And so as we try to bring something new in is, well, back to the other, how is the daily huddle actually going to help us get a product out the door faster? You know, so that kind of thing. So it's not like, let's just, let's just roll with this for a little while. Like, and we'll see. Mm. Not sure about that. I'm an engineer myself, so I can relate to that absolutely. You know, that that in analytical, data-driven, decision-making process. It's like, yeah, look, I'm going to make a decision, but I need to run the numbers. I need to go through all the options. And only when I'm absolutely convinced will I make a decision. Now, that is the engineering mindset, isn't it? That's the engineering approach to decision-making. And, you know, and they're going to rationalize it using their different mechanisms, their thought processes. Um but they're not just going to come on board. So you've got to take people on the journey. How did you go about pushing that behavior change through the organization? Do I need to be honest here? <laughs> <laughs> I would love you to be honest. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not proud of it. No, I'm not proud of it. But I, I, So we got all the teams with the exception of, surprise, surprise, research and development uh, were on board. Mm, within the first year, like I said, I blew up, I blew up the first two quarters because I pushed the whole thing first, but within the following six months, within the first year, everybody was doing it and everybody was, um, you know, aligned on best practices, you know, get in there, put your, you know, get your, uh, information ahead of time. So people can look at it ahead of time. So maybe they can help or not. Um, the research and development team were cut slack. So basically their notion was we have other tools so that we're tracking our progress and we meet, you know, to do this. So they were not pushed to comply, if I can use that word. Um, interestingly, until COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, it was like, I just brought in a decree. Everybody is going to be doing this and doing this the right way because we are now like everything's changing next Monday. We're all remote. This is the vehicle we're going to be using to communicate. You are either doing it with the team or you're not on the team. Um, and so that we, I was able to leverage COVID to get everybody to comply. But like I said, I'm not proud of it, but we, we gave RMD some slack. Well, you got to lead, right? At some point, someone has to make a decision and just go, run with it. You know, it was crazy, crazy, Jed. Once COVID hit and and everybody was putting their stuff in, uh, at least one of the two individuals from R and D that I was that you'd asked me about that were pushing back so hard. This guy was always the first with his huddle in, huddle information in. Was <laughs> once COVID hit, it was like, I'm in. <laughs> It's like, what happened? <laughs> well, I guess even engineers need that social interaction. And if the only way you're going to get social interaction is via a daily huddle, maybe that's what tipped him over. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. So it, it took you a while to get the, the foundations of the system in place. Uh, after you'd done that, how what changed I and mean, did you notice a definite change once everyone was on board you know because you know when we've spoken about this before you know you talked about you know building you know, building a team of a players and you know hiring people that were smarter than you you know the the, the, the dynamics in organizations often change once you get past that foundational implementation of metronomics that past the daily huddles and you got the execution rhythms going and you're now moving more on to strategy and team did you notice a distinct change at a certain point I'm just processing there's uh, several elements to your question there. So I guess the first thing I'd like to just talk about is that element of what changed, right? What made it, what helped get people on board? And one of the best parts of the daily huddle is that element of you say, stuck. Like, what are you stuck on today? Right? And the notion of the stuck being hey, this is me waving a white flag. I think I need some help. And then people starting to understand that helping was a good thing. Like helping was a good thing. And so by the next day, if the good news became that stuck I had yesterday is unstuck. And so it's, it's like that just sounds so simple, but 
when you have an organization that doesn't have something like that in place, it's amazing what kind of rabbit holes people will go down when they're in, in a situation with stuck, don't necessarily recognize it. Um, so once, you know, several people in the organization in different teams had flagged a stuck and they got help and it was unstuck the next day, there's this notion like, holy smokes, like, we can do more. We can do more than we're doing. And so it kind of raised the capacity of everybody in the organization. We even, we even went so far as everybody knew that it was like, we could never have a stuck go two days. Like that just does not happen. Like if a stuck even comes back a second, then it gets escalated right to the leadership team. And then the leadership team huddle, we figure out how the heck to get that stuck solved. So this whole notion of, you know, uh, this whole notion, first of all, of getting stuff done and getting stuff done timely, that's important, right? It's a big execution piece backed up with part of the culture is you help people. Like if you've got bandwidth or if you think you know something in that subject, get in there and help them and move it. So now your cohesiveness builds as well, right? And you're breaking down the silos. Totally. So take that combination and then layer in this whole aspect of what are our priorities for this quarter? And we're actually going to run effectively 90 day sprints to get these things done. So you go from this, you know, this daily cycle and then you go look out and what are we trying to do for 90 days? And you have people volunteer to own a priority so that they are actually volunteering to be accountable. So take those things together, right? And build out this notion of team and everybody's accountable to each other. And then individuals taking on priorities and they being accountable, not just to themselves, but to the whole company. All it's like just basically just raised that whole element of fundamentally execution and being way, way more efficient about what we were doing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So over time, you know, you saw the noise in the organization go down, but you saw the accountability and trust go up. Yeah. And, and I, you know, really, I think by the end of the, already, by the end of the first year, like people were going, wow, there's something to this, right? There's something to this. How quickly did you start to see results? Well, within the first year, for sure, because the, uh, you know, our, we had, oh God, that was, that reminded me of one of the t- most torturous exercises when, I, when Shannon asked me to forecast revenue, it's going like, right, and then forecast profitability. You're killing me. Anyways, at the end of the first year, we hit both those numbers. So it's like, and it was better than what we had done the five years previous. So it's like, seriously? So that was at the macro level, if you like, the, the, the cultural level was people, people getting excited about, you know, basically being excited about having something they're accountable for and driving for it. Uh, that was, uh, that was key. There's a finish line. They've got their name tagged to it and they don't want to look bad in front of their peers. So they want to get it done. They want to win. Totally. Totally. And I'm trying to remember exactly when it was. I think it was towards the end of the first year where we actually started having our monthly town halls. And in the monthly town halls, people would be, it would be open to anybody and they could get up and speak to what they did. And even if they didn't, if they were too shy, somebody else, a lead would go up there and say, you know, Jimmy nailed, you know, the, the scanner development priority for the quarter. In fact, is 25% ahead. Everybody give a hand for Jimmy. Well, everybody claps, you know? So then there's this, there's this recognition element too. And that was, that was so clear to me how much, uh, a players value recognition amongst their peers. So all of this thing just started building, um, from, you know, paying attention to people and, and being clear on accountabilities. It was quite remarkable. What, what, what do you think, which part of the system made the biggest impact for you at Vorum? If I need to pick something right now, I think what was hugely powerful was the whole 
quarterly planning exercise with the whole company. You did it with the whole company, not not just the leadership team. The whole company. We we started with leaders, but when we and it, it's how you know how it progresses. When we got to the stage where the quarterly planning, every functional team did quarterly planning with their lead. And then that information was brought to the pre-planning with the leads to review all that, to see what commonalities they were, were there things new that we didn't know. Then we had the planning with our coach, at that time, of course, with Shannon. Then we would take what we did with Shannon and we would bring it back to all the functional teams and say, hey, this is what's proposed, right? This is the proposed in order to, is there anything we've missed? Like, is there something here? that maybe we're off track on? Is there something maybe that didn't make it to the list that somebody's saying, whoa, you guys, like, you got it. You forgot about that. When we did that and every single person in the company was participating and had the opportunity to make a say as to what we're doing, like, like the alignment was unbelievable. It just, everybody was in, right? And they... Like their, their voices were heard in setting the priorities for the company each quarter, each and every quarter and including the annuals. And that was just so powerful, unbelievably powerful in terms of, again, getting the whole team moving, you know, that analogy, right? Are we all pulling the oars in the same direction, in the same cadence? Having the whole team involved meant that they all had a chance to have their say so they were much more likely to actually commit and then be accountable to what was agreed. 100%. You know, when we came back from the planning meetings many a time and the priorities were left there, they were not, nobody had, nobody on the leadership team had necessarily gone in and said, I'll volunteer to take that on. We would take them to the teams. And so then the people on the team says, just a second, you mean I can volunteer for a company priority? Pick me, like, I'm in, right? And so that was so cool, right? Because we kept telling the, we kept having this messaging that said, ideally, you know, your leadership team, you'd like to get the execution component of your leadership team down so that your leadership team can really concentrate on, on strategy. Um, and so this was, again, all, it was very consistent with the process. And, and you could see who your eight players were, the ones who just jumped at the opportunity to own the company priority, right? So the people that were crying out for development opportunities a couple of years before, they, they now had them. What for sure, right? And that was that was um thanks for tying that back because that was such a huge win there. Because they could see, you know, they could see what was going on and what we we're trying to do. How how long were you implementing metronomics for? Because you'd you'd had your, you know, four or five years of a plateau of you know no growth or minimal growth. And then you moved into working with the metronomics uh, growth system and at some point in time after that, you then exited the business. So how long did that process take from starting to exiting? And, and how did Metronomics help the exit? Sorry, there were a few questions there. <laughs> uh, you're challenging me. I love it. I love it. That's so great. So, yeah, we actually started with Shannon in the spring of 2015. Um, and let's see. So by the spring of 2019, we had put uh, the company on the market. So that was four years in and the sale happened in November of 2020. Um, and I was on for six more months after that. So in total, that'll be spring of 2021. So in total six years, six years as, uh, you know, basically as a CEO or as a transitioning CEO in Vorm. So you actually sold during the COVID period. Oh yeah. Did that help? Or hinder? Um, let's just say that the buyer was, as a result of the whole, our whole presentation of which the metronomics and the MGS open playing field in particular, it had them confident enough to go through with the sale eight months in when uh, basically five months before all their funding for acquisitions had been shut down to zero. So the short answer to your question is it was a massive help. It, I don't I don't think it would have happened without it. Yeah. And, and sorry, mate, the, 
the question I, I thought I was asking was, did COVID help or hinder? Oh my gosh. Um, COVID absolutely hindered. Yeah. Okay. I would have expected it to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, it was so brutal. So, so the buyer came along, they looked at your books, they looked at your strategy, they looked at your systems. What, what were they saying to you about, you know, what they saw? You know, obviously it was the metronomics was a huge help you mentioned just a moment ago. Now, what particularly were they, were they pointing out as being, yeah, this is giving us confidence that this is a worthwhile acquisition? Yeah. So you hit the word that came to my mind right away is this whole notion about confidence, right? So the guys that work in the M&A field, they look at, you know, SIMS, whatever, confidential information memorandums all the time. It's kind of like nice glossy stuff, the top numbers, either they're interested or not. And then if they are, they come in and they do the interview process and want to understand a little bit more about what's under the hood, right? So in our case, what was absolutely fantastic, going back to their buyers, they want to be confident, using your word, the confident that they're buying something that's worthwhile, right? They want to be confident that the price they're going to pay matches the value that's there. So the fantastic thing that we were able to show them is we could show them the one-page plan, right? And in the one-page plan, first of all, it showed what our vision was, where, you know, where are we headed? What's our BHAG? What's our North Star, right? And then it showed where our three-year was and the one-year, all that stuff, all beautifully lined up. Um, that's part of the overall. But more importantly, once they saw the overall, now we just go back and we show them the pro you know, just the prior year. And when, they, when we show them stuff, first of all, they could see all these various people taking on priorities for the company. They could see that some were made and some were not. Um, you know, they could see what situations where we had forecast something and we didn't make it. And then the next time we actually re we forecasted for the next quarter and we did a little bit better. They could see the whole process to the point where in the, in the previous two years, actually not even true in all four years, what we had forecast for revenue and profitability, we hit. So this notion of this company is actually predictable in terms of revenue and profitability. They can forecast, which is incredible. And um, because we were talking to or attempting to talk to strategics in particular, they're making a case for they want their valuation to be based on their future projections, not just what happened, right? So the fact that we sh could show them the history right there, like complete to like unbelievable discrete detail, um, gave them more confidence in the future, co even though COVID was, was in there, right? They still, we were able to build up this picture of we can we can deliver for you product, predictable revenue and profitability. The next part that was so vital is they could see that my involvement in execution consistently became less and less and less. It's right there, right? They could see company priorities by the last three quarters. I had none. I have no I had no ownership of company priorities at all. So where the typical thing was, well, we need the CEO to stay on for two to three years. Um, we made the case from our side, or at least the people representing us said, you know, you can see, like, it's right there. Carl's not responsible for execution at all. It's the leadership team and their team around them that's making this happen. So what do you think? Like, what do you think in six months is, is probably all you need? And they go, gosh, based on what we're seeing here, that seems reasonable. So I got set. It free set loose, you know, six months after, which was very unusual um, in the in the MA world at that time. So, but that was to to back going and looping that back. That was completely facilitated by having the you know the metrology growth system and a one page plan and all the you know all the quarters there for all to see. Did they go in with a fine tooth comb and look at everyone? No. They didn't need to. They could just see what was going on. And we had on two occasions of the final four that were making bids, the people that were handling the M&A side said, we, we've been actually working on 
100 and 200 million dollar companies that do not have this level of planning in place. This is for the size of your, this is absolutely remarkable. I had a very similar experience about three years ago. I took one of my, um, my clients to sale. Um, I've been working with them for a couple of years and made two and a half time their revenue. Uh, and they got um, strategically acquired by one of the big four consulting companies. Uh, and same story. They they were able to show the progression over two years. You know they you know they they had the swim lanes in place. They had their thirty sixer, you know the their thirty six month rolling P and L, and they could go back and they could track exactly what happened over the two years, the successes, uh, the few failures where maybe they've been a bit aggressive, but generally they were hitting their targets, hitting their priorities every quarter over that two year period. Uh, and the feedback from the acquiring company was like, you know, well, this is a really simple acquisition. The acquisition was done, dusted in six weeks from first contact. And they also got a multiple on future revenue based on the forecasts in the 36-month forecast. Beautiful. That's a beautiful story. That's outstanding. Yeah, when that when that happens, it's like, you know, boom. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. It's a great thing to be a part of. Yeah. Well done. That's cool. Yeah. So, so you got to the end of your six months. Um, you know, to, to use your language, you know, you got cut loose. What then? Well, I retired. <laughs> How'd that go? <laughs> Lasted one month. What? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, I get away and I was going from, you know, whatever, 120 miles an hour down to five. No, that's not going to work. Um, no, not at all. No. So, yeah. So from that perspective, I also knew I was not about to go back to anything full time. That's for sure. And so I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to find an opportunity to give back on, for me, you know, a part time basis. And, um, I reached out to Shannon, uh, to see if they would consider you know, training me up to be a coach and, uh, they kindly agreed to do that. And, and that's super fun for me because it gives me a way to give back to, you know, an initiative that made such a difference in the growth of our, of my company. So effectively you've been coaching as a metronomics coach since 2021. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Carl, I want to, I want to step back just, um, a short, a short, um, bit. You talked about, you know, you, you, you retired and you lasted a month. And, and this, this is something I think, you know, we, we don't really talk about is that, you know, when, when leaders get cut loose, they exit their business. You now they, they probably come into a little bit of money and uh, they, they go from, as you said, going from 120 miles an hour to five miles an hour. People don't anticipate the impact that's going to have on them emotionally from a connection point of view from a value to the world and community point of view um, and i've had a, a few clients who have sort of you know, gone through that process and they're completely lost you know they just don't know what their role is in the world anymore and you know and i've had stories where you know some have turned to sort of you know, alcohol or you know even to, to drugs and and um you know, it, it's it's such a massive transition that most people don't appreciate it until they go through it and um it's it's something that i've had to sort of give a lot of support to, to clients you know going through that transition and it's something i prepare my clients for as they go into an exit okay right we're planning for the acquisition this is all consuming but we also have to think about what happens next you know you you go and buy your boat you go and buy the motorcycle what next you know what next and people just don't think about that yeah i mean i love the fact that you used those two words what next because i honestly um 24 hours after I sold the business, that was my, those, those were the two words that came to my mouth right away. What next? Now, your identity is forged in being a CEO of a growing, successful business. And all of a sudden, that identity is ripped away from you. Yeah. I, and I agree with you totally. Um, I made it worse for myself in the sense that I had actually, had five other occasions where I was trying to sell a business and all five had failed. 
and one of which had got right to the altar, like literally everything done, one signature left. And so by the time on by the time this one came around, and you mentioned around COVID too and all that stuff, so I just I would not allow myself to go into a, any kind of what next discussion because um if I felt it would I would take my eyes off the prize of getting the deal done. And and this one too, right up until three hours before was at risk. Um so yeah, so coming out at the back end with those what next questions was brutal, brutal, brutal. So I'm I I just think it's so great that you have built in to your practice the notion of helping prepare. Cause my situation was very much post. Um the, the company that helped me do the acquisition reached out to me right away to their credit and said, hey, you may need some support on this. And I'm going like, yep, I sure think I will. Um, and then, you know, proceeded to tell me a very similar story about a founder who 100% owner who sold his business for something, you know, whatever, something around like 150 million U.S. and uh, they were looking around for him at the party, celebrating the whole thing. And next thing you know, they found him out on the back, basically lying out on a bench. And he was bawling his eyes out. He was just like, where to now? Right. And I'm thinking like, oh, man, so, so hard. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, that, that notion of spending some time to reflect on what's important next and what you want to do is, uh, gosh, if you can do it beforehand and still keep, keep your eyes on the prize. Oh man, so much power to you. Um, if it comes after, um, there's a lot of soul searching and emotional processing to do before you can even begin to think about it. So, you know, so anyways, that's, that's really, it's, it's a great, Great commentary and, and very real, very real. And it, and it is a real step in, in the exit process that many, many overlook. So, yeah, you, if, you, if you're listening to this and uh, this it seems real, you know, there's help out there. Go get help. Yeah, please do. Because it's, it's, again, another thing, it's just way, way, way too hard to do alone. So having exited, you became a metronomics coach. You're still coaching now. You're coaching tech companies. What, what does your portfolio look like now? So I have two clients right now. So um, that seems to be pretty comfortable zone for me. Um, if I was to do a third client, that would probably top me out just in terms of uh, the other things that I enjoy doing now that I'm semi-retired, <laughs> which seems to be a, a moniker I'm quite comfortable with <laughs> by comparison. Yeah. So you, you've seen both sides, you know, you've been the CEO, you know, you've, you've been the, you, you are the coach you know, and you've seen it in, in uh, over the last 10 years, really, you know, you've seen that sort of, you know, that, that whole journey of being a CEO and then moving into, into being a coach. And this is, this is a, another hard question for you. Uh, so take some time if you want to think about this. What is the one thing that you think has been the biggest learning in that time, either as a CEO or now as the coach? So, so many learnings along the way. Pick your top three. Well, that's generous. <laughs> if I waited long enough, I get this question made easier. Uh, so I think going, like going back to um, an earlier comment, you know, when you asked me about what had the most impact, this notion of uh, getting the whole team involved. Um, so that for me is that whole notion of understanding that you can really only grow your business if you're committed to growing your people. And if you're committed to growing your people, that means get them all in. So really embrace transparency. Like if you're not going to embrace transparency, then this isn't a journey you want to do. So that's a big one. And, uh, and it, and I want to preface that by saying like my mistake was, as I said earlier, was trying to get everybody in right away. Um, so there's baby steps to build that. That has to be your end game, though, because you don't want to be the CEO that's working 80 to 100 hours a week just trying to get to the next place. You really would like to be the CEO that is, 
you know, maybe, you know, on Bondi Beach or something in Australia or on the top of Whistler or something where you're basically thinking about something strategic or not and know and have the confidence that the company is running beautifully without you there. So how can you achieve that if you're not committed to transparency, right? So that's that's a big, big part. Um, I think the other thing is the, I'm going to go with the, I'm going to go with the one-on-ones because the one-on-ones yeah, okay. tie to that as well. So remember I said early on, I'm a slow learner. I was said, really, like get one-on-ones going real soon. I got, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'm thinking like, have I had time? Like, where am I going to have time for that? And again, when you do the one-on-ones in a structured way with the same questions each time and you make it clear that the one-on-one is for the team member, for the team member to come forward with things, they drive the agenda and it's communicated ahead of time and you have that kind of uh, just very direct, um, scheduled interaction with your team members. And it just, it just again, reinforces that that really they they matter hugely like without them it isn't going to grow so uh once we started once we started doing the one-on-ones through the organization and and people again you know the team members were so shocked initially that they drove the agenda right it was this one-on-one is for you it's not actually for the leader it's for you and as the one-on-ones you know uh, rolled out, what happened was when we got to things like the quarterly reviews and the annual reviews, guess what? No surprises or minimal surprises. You know, people knew along the way. So that whole notion again of, you know, supporting your people to, to achieve their best and be their best selves is massive, right? Um, and then if you give me a third, I'll grab it for sure. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I I think I'm going to go with the three hag as the third, because that notion of having something just far enough out to, you know, to build, you know, where we're going, um, and yet not like, like the B hag is awesome. That's the North Star. But the three hag is you can almost touch it. It's just there, right? And so when you set up, even with someone as skeptical and, and frankly as afraid of me at the beginning, when you set up numbers out three years out, there's something about it that's kind of believable, right? And and so and then you know then the waterfall comes down through everything else. So. Thanks so much for giving me three options. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I did because they were good ones. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for the insight. Oh, yeah. there. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so Carl, th- thanks so much today. There's, there's, uh, it's been fascinating to going through your journey and uh, hearing about you know the the trials and tribulations of uh, your growth through Forum and and your transition to a coach, uh, and also spending some time going through the exit process because you know, if you haven't gone through one of those before, you know, they they can be quite challenging and well, they're very challenging, but certainly intimidating and, and stressful. And you know, there's, there's no such thing as a stress-free acquisition from what I've seen. Yeah. I would actually say that going through the exit process was the most stressful thing I did in the business in its entire journey. So thanks so much. Thanks so much for the time. Uh, you brought back all kinds of memories for me and frankly, uh, very enjoyable ones. So thank you. Yeah. Well, th- thanks so much for sharing your insight. It's been a really good conversation. I, I, I love our chats. They're great. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Take care, Jeff. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this 20 plus year old proven system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else that great podcasts are found.